episode 100 of Toke Signals TV, where we bring you the biggest in cannabis and hemp news stories every week. I'm Steve Elliott, the editor at ToteSignals.com, and I'll be guiding you through the news. First, let's look at our Toke Signals Bud Pick of the Week. We have some gorgeous Space Dog this week. This is a TGA Subcool strain. It's an Indica dominant, and it results from a cross of Super Snow Dog times Space Queen. Very tasty indeed. Let's do the news now, shall we? In the United Kingdom this week, Parliament plans to debate cannabis legalization next month in what looks to be a first for the UK. Parliament will be having this debate on October 12th. It was announced by authorities in the House of Commons. This proposal would make the production, sale, and use of cannabis legal, reports John Stone at The Independent. This debate is being held in response to an official petition on the Parliament website, which received more than 213,000 signatures as of Wednesday. The debate, which will take place in Westminster Hall, will be led by Labor MP Paul Flynn, a member of the Parliament Petition Committee. Flynn previously called for the legalization of marijuana for medical use, introducing a bill to do so in 1999 and supporting another along with Liberal Democrat MP Tom Brake back in 2008. Now, next month's debate is unlikely to lead to any actual change in the law in the UK, according to political observers, but it could put additional pressure on the government to act. The government's official response to the petition was quite negative. Substantial scientific evidence shows cannabis is a harmful drug that can damage human health. The response reads, there are no plans to legalize cannabis as it would not address the harm to individuals and communities. The response claimed legalization would, quote, send the wrong message. The government did not respond when asked if it believed cannabis is more harmful than alcohol. A study published this summer in the U.S. found that marijuana users are no more likely than normal to suffer mental health problems, including depression and psychosis. We urge all of our MPs to participate in an informed, pragmatic, evidence-based, compassionate debate, resulting at the very least in allowing sick people a legitimate, effective medicine that vastly improves their quality of life without fear of criminalization, said John Liebling, political director of the United Patients Alliance, which campaigns for medicinal cannabis. The UK has moved in the opposite direction of the rest of the world at large in recent years, actually making cannabis worse against the law. In 2009, the last Labour government responding to sensationalistic tabloid articles about the supposed hazards of skunk strain cannabis moved its classification back to a Class B drug, meaning anyone caught with it can be sent to prison for five years, and anyone who supplies cannabis can be in prison for up to 14 years. In Nevada this week, tourists can now buy medical marijuana in Las Vegas. Fifteen years after Nevada voters approved the legalization of medical marijuana, the first dispensary opened its doors on August 24th in Clark County. The Southwest Las Vegas shop is allowed under state law to serve tourists who are registered medical marijuana patients in their home states, as well as Nevada residents. We've been so busy there are lines around the corner at some times of the day, said Darlene Purdy, managing director at Euphoria Wellness. Purdy said the dispensary has seen more than 100 patients a day. Patients are so happy, she said. Some people have been waiting 15 years for this. As long as out-of-state visitors are registered medical marijuana patients at home with a valid authorization and government-issued ID, they are welcome to buy medical marijuana during their Vegas vacation. Nevada has set up the gold standard of medical marijuana programs, according to State Senator Tick Segerblom, who sponsored the bill that led up to the legalization of dispensaries. He said the reaction has been overwhelmingly positive. I haven't heard of anything negative, Segerblom said. It took 15 years to get here, but there hasn't been one peep of the sky is falling. Everybody is on board with this thing. Well, with a couple of exceptions. In May 2014, the Gaming Control Board sent a note to its licensees saying, quote, unless the federal law is changed, the board does not believe investment or any other involvement in a medical marijuana facility or establishment by a person who has received a gaming approval or has applied for a gaming approval is consistent with the effective regulation of gaming. 
Despite the gaming board's advice for casinos to steer clear of medical cannabis, Segerblom has high hopes for the cannabis industry in Nevada, including the legalization of recreational marijuana for adults 21 and older, which will appear on the ballot next year. It's going to be great for our industry, which is tourism, Segerblom said. We have 40 million people a year. If 10% of those people went to a dispensary, watch out. Let's regulate it, tax it, Zuckerblom said. We're known as the place you go to do things that you can't do elsewhere, so why not smoke a little pot, too? In the United States this week, at least 67 people are serving life sentences for marijuana. The plight of marijuana lifers has received new attention since the release last week of Jeff Mazansky, who had been one of them. Man, I feel great. Mazansky, now a great-grandfather after serving more than 20 years in prison, said as he looked at his first weekend as a free man in two decades. His sentence was commuted in May from life without parole to simple life in prison, and last week he walked out of a maximum security prison in Missouri, a free man. Mazansky was sentenced in 1996 for trying to distribute six pounds of Mexican weed. There was no violence in Bob but he had two previous convictions for the possession and sale of marijuana totaling 10 ounces. That meant under Missouri law at the time that he was a persistent drug offender, subject to any punishment short of the death penalty. That law is no longer in effect, but similar policies continue to fill American prisons. More than 20 states have legalized cannabis for one purpose or another, and with $22 billion in legal sales expected by 2020, marijuana is becoming another consumer product. But these new laws don't help people with past marijuana convictions, including some with sentences harsher than those for rape or murder. About 40,000 inmates of state and federal prisons have a conviction involving marijuana, according to research co-authored by UCLA professor Mark Kleiman. About half of those are for marijuana offenses alone, and all of them are victims of the drug war hysteria that swept America in the 1980s and 90s. Between 1996 and 2014, federal judges sentenced 54 people to life without parole for marijuana offenses, according to the Clemency Report. The ACLU found about a dozen more cases at the state level, and at least a dozen more exist beyond that, according to advocacy groups. One of these men was busted for selling just 32 grams of marijuana. Another was involved in the sale of 130 grams, the equivalent of less than a carton of cigarettes. Others were caught in cases involving between 2 and 50 pounds of weed. All got life in prison, and that's where they remain. Some of Mazansky's fellow inmates thought he was lying when he told them he was doing life in prison for selling 6 pounds of pot. At first, I was really angry about the sentence, Jeff said. Then I was more disappointed. This is America. This isn't supposed to happen in America. It wasn't until 2012 that Mazansky's story started to become known. The advocacy group Show Me Cannabis filed a Missouri legalization initiative, which fell short, but Mazansky's son, Chris, got involved in the movement. Chris had been just 15 years old when his dad went to prison. They took my father away from me for 22 years, he said. That's a lot of time, a lot of memories. He missed so much, and all of us have missed out on so much. Chris got Show Me Cannabis interested in his dad's story, which led to press coverage and an online petition, which swelled to 400,000 signatures. A dozen state legislators signed on, and ultimately Governor Jay Nixon in May commuted Mazansky's sentence, making him eligible for parole. Jeff Mazansky said he plans to join his son Chris in the fight for marijuana legalization and prison reform just as soon as he does a bit of catching up. I've never been on the internet, Mazansky said. In the United States this week, control by prison lobby, Hillary Clinton is unlikely to end the war on drugs. More and more Americans have come to realize that the war on drugs is a colossal failure. But presidential contender Hillary Clinton doesn't seem to be one of those. Hillary seems unlikely to end that feudal war and the mass incarceration which results from it due to her ties to the prison lobby. The pattern of mass incarceration triggered by the drug war has resulted in the arrests of millions of otherwise law-abiding Americans, and it's unfairly targeted the economically disadvantaged and people of color. Clinton has stayed mostly silent on the failures of current drug policy during her presidential campaign. She has historically been opposed to marijuana decrim, and despite voters confronting her on multiple occasions, has failed to clarify her current stance on marijuana policy. 
In the 1990s, Hillary favored harshly punitive sentences to deter people from violating drug laws, including three strikes measures, which proved both disastrous and unconstitutional. We need more police. We need more and tougher prison sentences for repeat offenders, Hillary said in 1994. The three strikes and you're out for violent offenders has to be part of the plan, she said. We need more prisons to keep violent offenders for as long as it takes to keep them off the streets. Washington insiders collecting cash for Hillary's campaign are the same ones that lobby politicians on behalf of the prison industry, reports Sarah Lazare at Common Dreams. The Clinton prison connection is worrying drug law reform advocates, especially when contrasted with Bernie Sanders' call to abolish private prisons. It's no wonder why cannabis law reform advocates and drug war reformers have largely supported Sanders' campaign. Also in the U.S. this week, the chief of the Drug Enforcement Administration said marijuana is dangerous and should stay in Schedule 1. New Federal Drug Enforcement Administration head Chuck Rosenberg, in a TV interview last week, called marijuana dangerous and added, if we come up with a medical use for it, that would be wonderful. But we haven't. The woefully misinformed DEA administrator also said that federal drug agents in the field won't be discouraged from working on big marijuana cases, despite directives from the Obama administration to not waste resources pursuing state-compliant providers. I've been very clear to my agents in charge, Rosenberg said. If you have a big marijuana case, if that in your jurisdiction is one of your biggest problems, then bring it. That, of course, leaves the door open for pot-hating federal prosecutors to continue their war on marijuana, same as it ever was. Fox News asked Rosenberg about the continued inclusion of cannabis in Schedule 1, the federal government's harshest and most dangerous category of narcotics. Marijuana is dangerous, Rosenberg replied. It's certainly not as dangerous as other Schedule 1 controlled substances. It's not as dangerous as heroin, clearly, but it's still dangerous, Rosenberg claimed. It's not good for you. I wouldn't want my children smoking it. I wouldn't recommend that anyone do it. So I frankly don't see a reason to remove it. I'm not willing to say that it's good for you or that it ought to be legalized, Rosenberg said. I think it's bad for you and that it ought to remain illegal. He failed, of course, to adequately explain why it's so dangerous that it ought to continue being considered the legal equivalent of heroin and more dangerous, according to the federal government, than both methamphetamine and cocaine both of which the feds consider less dangerous Schedule II substances. When asked if U.S. law enforcement is aware of the location of Sinaloa cartel drug lord Joaquin Archibaldo Guzman, also known as El Chapo, who is one of the world's most notorious kingpins and is now at large, Rosenberg responded, not that I can share with you. Asked if there's one single sector of the Mexican government that is free of drug cartel corruption, Rosenberg answered, I don't know. I would hope so. He later cited Mexican agents who worked with DEA operatives and called them good and trusted allies, saying their existence shows pockets of integrity within the Mexican drug enforcement system. In Kansas this week, a 65-year-old Vietnam veteran was denied his pain medication after testing positive for marijuana. A nationwide argument between the Veterans Administration and groups which protect the rights of veterans emerged as a result. The issue, whether veterans should be denied prescription medications because they use marijuana for physical or emotional pain, even in states which allow marijuana use, arose when a Vietnam vet was denied his pain pills because he tested positive for pot. I went in to get a refill on my pain medication and they refused to let me have it because I have marijuana in my blood said disabled Vietnam veteran Gary Dixon, 65. While in Vietnam, Dixon was exposed to Agent Orange. I hurt, and I hurt from something I got fighting for my country, Dixon said. He now has stage four lung cancer, apparently doesn't have much time left to live, and he readily ad admits to smoking marijuana. Dixon and his wife, Debbie, on Tuesday, drove to Topeka from Fort Scott, like they customarily do for Dixon's stroke group therapy and to pick up his pain medicine. But this time he had to take a urine test and sign an opiate consent form. I said if she was wanting to see if I still smoke marijuana, I said I do, said Dixon, who added he had been using cannabis since 1972. He takes 10 to 15 prescription pills per day, but Tuesday afternoon 
he walked out of the VA hospital empty handed. If you take marijuana and you take pain medication, these are two things that decrease your alertness, lamely offered Dr. Daniel Klein, chief of ambulance with the Kansas VA. A growing number of veterans nationwide are being forced to sign opiate consent forms, which claim negative effects of mixing pain pills and marijuana. Now, cannabis actually decreases the amounts of opiates needed, which results in fewer opiate overdose deaths. For links to scientific studies proving this, just check out the story online. Under VA guidelines, veterans can't get their prescriptions filled if they test positive for marijuana. I have always had marijuana in my blood and will continue to have it in my blood, Dixon said unapologetically. If Dixon quit pot, could he have his pain medicine back? Everything is done on a case-by-case -case basis, Dr. Klein said, so I can't say with 100% certainty. Dixon said he'll continue using cannabis for his physical and emotional pain and try to come up with the $400 a month for his prescriptions. Several veterans' rights groups are lobbying Congress to change the VA's policy in states which allow medical marijuana. Kansas, however, doesn't allow it. In the U.S. this week, seniors are seeking out states where marijuana is legal. There's a new factor that's playing a big role when seniors choose retirement locales these days the marijuana laws. With 23 states and the District of Columbia having legalized medical marijuana and four states plus D.C. legalizing the herb for recreational purposes, it's starting to have a real impact on such choices. Since retirees don't have to check off a box on a form saying why they chose a particular location for their sunset years, figuring out how many people are retiring to the legal states is challenging. But there is anecdotal evidence that people with health conditions which medical marijuana could help treat are relocating to states with legalized marijuana, according to Michael Stoley, professor of public policy at the University of California, Los Angeles, who studies retiree migration trends. Stoll cites data from United Van Lines, which show the top U.S. moving destination last year was Oregon, where marijuana had been expected to be legalized for years and finally passed a ballot initiative last November. Two-thirds of moves involving Oregon were inbound, a 5% jump over the previous year as the state continues to pull away from the pack, United Van Lines said in a report. The Mountain West, including Colorado, which legalized medical marijuana in 2000 and recreational use in 2012, boasted the highest percentage of people moving there to retire, according to United Van Lines. One-third of movers topped that region and said they were going there specifically to retire. A lot of the things marijuana is best at are conditions which become more of an issue as you grow older, according to Taylor West, Deputy Director of the Denver-based National Cannabis Industry Association. Chronic pain, inflammation, insomnia, loss of appetite, all of those things are widespread among seniors. In Colorado, since legalization, many dispensaries have seen the largest portion of sales going to baby boomers and people of retirement age, according to West. About half of the people coming into our shop are seniors, said Carl Keitch, founder of the Collective Garden Seattle Medical Marijuana Association. It's a place where your mother or grandmother can come in and feel safe. Before we go this week, we have a must read on tokesignals.com. It's from Sherry Sicard, who does so much to aid the plight of marijuana lifers. This one is Meet Antonio Bascaro, the nation's longest serving marijuana prisoner. Antonio has served more than 35 years behind bars for a nonviolent marijuana conspiracy offense, and that gives him the dubious honor of being the nation's and maybe the world's longest serving marijuana prisoner. To find out what you can do to help Antonio, visit tokesignals.com. Looking forward to seeing you next week. If you happen to be attending the Cannabis World Congress in LA on Thursday and Friday, I hope to see you there. Until next time, stay lifted. <music>